Two patches behind us since the start of Notlan, I think we can all say that there have been a lot of reveals. Originally, I was going to make a full recap and theory video, but given how long this video is already, I decided to split things up. So this will be a full recap of the Notlan Archon quest up through patch 5.1, and I'll be putting up a theory video later. With all this being said, the best place to start in any story is at the beginning. So let's start there. Paimon and the Traveler arrive in Notlan and are immediately in awe of the strange landscape, truly unlike anything else we've ever seen in Tibet. From canyons and tall trees to the strange and dynamic forms of the local fauna, arriving in Notlan almost feels like you're arriving in a different world. We also discovered, despite unlocking a statue of the Seven, that we for some reason have not resonated with the pyro element. As we wander, we stumble upon a child who has two teammates who are asking to leave her team. When we approach, the young girl introduces herself as Kachina and explains about the pilgrimage. She states that as an ancient name bearer, she's expected to lead a team, but since people don't want to be on her team, she has no team. Being the magnanimous people we are, the Traveler agrees to be on Kachina's team, and with that we set off towards the Stadium of the Sacred Flame. Along the way, Kachina explains to us a bit more about how Notlan works, like the fact that the Pyro Archon is human and that the new Pyro Archons are selected once the old one dies. We meet a wonderful and interesting NPC along the way, which is a giant Saurian named Toto, who seems to be good friends with Kachina. Toto helps carry us part of the way to the stadium, cementing Toto as the best NPC in all of Notlan. However, upon arriving at the stadium, we discover that since we're outlanders, we actually can't participate in the pilgrimage, as the point of the pilgrimage is to collect contending flame, a sort of fuel for the sacred flame to push back the abyss, which is always on the verge of invading Notlan. We meet Mualani and Kanich, along with his trusty, if not slightly dickish sidekick, Ahau, where things are explained in a little bit more detail. The point of the pilgrimage is to select ancient name bearers to delve into the Night Kingdom and fight the Abyss in what are called Night Warden Wards. So as long as their team is victorious, when they return, they can be revived by the Ode of Resurrection, assuming anyone died in the war. With the issues of Kachina's team still at play, Mualani decides to volunteer herself to join Kachina in the first part of the competition, Kanich taking over Mualani's team. With the spectacular effort of Kachina and Mualani, they are able to make it through to the second phase of the competition, which is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Kachina faces derision from NPCs and her own self-doubt, but decides she's going to fight as hard as she possibly can. She defeats many foes, but her final opponent is her friend Mualani, who has already served in several Night Warden Wars. Despite this perceived power imbalance, Kachina is able to beat Mualani, cementing her place in the Night Warden Wars. Now, whether or not a child should be allowed to compete in the first place, I think is super debatable. But nonetheless, our Night Warden warriors line up and are sent off to the Night Kingdom. During this time, Mualani offers to take us to the People of the Springs, which is her tribe, to show us around. Apparently, the People of the Springs have hot springs. I know, shocking. But they are the best vacation spot in Notlan on account of the beautiful water and, well, hot springs. We show up and we meet a very lovely NPC named Auntie Atea. Mualani explains to us that Auntie Atea also fought in the Night Warden Wars for many years until she was injured and infected with abyssal corruption. This also resulted in her being unable to use the hot springs, despite that being her favorite hobby. But Mualani reveals that they've seen Auntie Atea sneaking off into the hot springs at night, so she must be getting better. Because, you know, there would be no other explanation for that. In any case, we work hard to set up a proper party for Auntie Atea, but that night, the Abyss attacks, and we get a sort of glimpse into what life is truly like for those living in Notlan. Despite fighting off the Abyss, there is a lot of damage to the tribe, and though the Traveler tries to use their powers to purify some of the Abyssal corruption in Atea, and it does put off her immediate death, at the Hot Spring party, Atea reveals to us the real reason she's been going into the Hot Springs again. She's dying. The corruption has damaged her body too much, and there's just nothing she can do about it. She gives us a token of hers to give to the Pyro Archon, and with that, we have to leave Atea to her fate. We journey back to the stadium, and though the team was successful in pushing back the Abyss, and everyone there participates in the Ode of Resurrection, there's a notable absentee, Kachina. Chaos erupts in the stadium, and people are confused and vaguely horrified that Kachina wasn't brought back. 
Of course, there's a group of NPCs that claim Kachina didn't deserve to get resurrected, which, holy fuck, my dude, maybe read the room a little, that's a literal child. Luckily, someone who does have a normal reaction to this information is Mulani, who angrily calls out the useless NPCs and a fight almost breaks out before Mavuika, the Pyro Archon, has to come out and basically be like, y'all, the pilgrimage is on hold, everyone needs to chill out until we figure what's going on. The NPCs then reluctantly shut up, and Mulani basically interrogates the Archon on what her plan is, to which Mavuika has to admit that she doesn't know what's going on, but Mulani can join her in figuring it out. Of course, we as the Traveler, certified BAMF, are invited as well. It's here that we discuss the current situation, and ultimately with the combination of Kanich, Ionsen, Chaska, Mulani, and yours truly, we all figure out that we need the Spirit Speaker Stone from the Masters of the Nightwind to reconstruct Kachina's ancient name for a chance to bring her back. And additionally, that the contending fire being harvested from each pilgrimage isn't enough to protect Notlan from the Abyss, which is why there's been more and more attacks. Mulalani, Chaska, and again yours truly, decide to go to the Scions of Canopy who have the Spirit Speaker Stone, while Ionsen and Kanich stay back with the Pyro Archon. Mavuika, like the badass she is, uses some of her power to stabilize the Sacred Flame, but shortly after this we get our first look at the Captain. He shows up and starts spouting some nonsense about how Mavuika hasn't kept her promise, so he's there to save Notlan. Mavuika says bet, let's fight homeboy, and one of the coolest fight scenes with the Harbinger is shown as the two go absolutely batshit on each other. Of course, Mavuika punches the captain so hard that he nearly crumples to the ground, but then he's rescued by a bunch of black smoke, and Mavuika is like, damn, I really hope that's not who I think it is, and has Kanichigo meet with Lali to ask her who might be able to produce black smoke like that. Smash cutting back to the group that actually matters, we get the Spirit Speaker Stone and have to talk to another NPC to help us reconstruct Kachina's ancient name. This NPC is Vichama, and he agrees to help us if we agree to help him find his long since dead friend. Because, you know, the fact that a child is alone in the Night Kingdom is apparently not enough to get him to help us right off the bat. Upon obtaining the Spirit Speaker Stone, Vichama begins the ritual, and we as the Traveler continue to purify Vichama to protect him from abyssal corruption, while the rest of the group fights the abyss monsters the Spirit Speaker Stone attracts. We are able to recreate Kachina's name and give some amount of closure to Vichama. Chaska is forced to destroy the Spirit Speaker Stone to save Vichama's life, though he's still contaminated by abyssal energy. Upon returning to the village, we find out Chaska was a wild child, literally, who was adopted by Koichi's family, Koichi being her younger sister. The sisters argue about Chaska going back into the Night Kingdom, but when Chaska points out a literal fucking child is missing, Koichi agrees to support her. With all this being said, Chief Waina worries that Silali will be upset with her Spirit Speaker Stone being destroyed, but there's no time for any of that nonsense as it's a race against time to save Kachina. Back at the stadium, both groups meet up with the exception of Kanich, and Mavika explains what happened with the captain. She begins performing a ritual to try and contact Kachina, and in this process we find out more about Mavuika, and the Pyro Archons as a whole. She shows us a room full of souvenirs she's obtained from various friends that she's had, along with a family portrait she had of her family. Once the ritual is complete, the group sees Kachina and tells her that we are going to be on our way to rescue her, and that she needs to just hold on for a bit longer. Confirmation that Kachina is still alive, but being actively hunted by the Abyss motivates the group further, and Mualani, Chaska, Yansen, and again, yours truly, agree to dive dick first back into the Night Kingdom to bring Kachina home. Yansen leads us to the entrance of the Night Kingdom, which is under some ruins, and we're transported to the realm of consciousness that is the Night Kingdom. As a quick aside, it's important to think of the Night Kingdom as something similar to A's realm of consciousness or the realm that the Ermensoul Tree exists in. We experience the world physically, but it's not an actual physical place in Notlan. Smashing back into the Night Kingdom, we realize that shit is even more fucked than we realize with abyssal creatures everywhere. But as a happy accident, Vichama's friend that he was trying to bring back to life was awakened from the Sea of Souls and helps guide us to Kachina. Kachina was being attacked by Rift Wolves and we arrived just in time to save her. Kachina then asks that before we go, we go help the Wyab of her tribe, who she reveals was using its limited power to shield and hide her from the Abyss. The friendly NPC spirit explains that the Wyabs are all being corrupted by the Abyss, and if they are destroyed, all of Notlan will be lost. Kachina leads us to the Wyab, where we begin to purify it, but what would you know, an Abyss Lector shows up, having killed the friendly NPC spirit. 
The Abyss Lecter claims that it's not an active participant in the machinations of the Mindless Abyss, and merely wants to see the destruction it brings about, all while claiming that the Pyro Archon has the ability to stop all this, but refuses to share her power with the people, making everything Notlon stands for meaningless. Kachina is distraught, but Mualani tells the Abyss Lecter to fuck right off, and the two dive into a battle with the Abyss Lecter. Due to Mualani's actions, as well as just being an overall encouraging sort of person, she awakens as one of the heroes of Notlan. Tupac, a great warrior from the people of the Springs, appears to her and congratulates her for her acknowledging her true self and embodying all that it means to be from the people of the Springs, lending her his power and memories. It's during this that it's revealed that Malvika's plan has been in motion for 500 years, and that Mualani is an integral part of it. We finish purifying the Wyab, who praises Kachina and reassures her of her growth, before telling them to leave quickly as the rift is becoming more unstable. The group races back to the rift, but it's too late. The light closes, leaving the group trapped in the Night Kingdom. Or so they think. Malvika, using the combined power of all of the contending fires stored in all of the artifacts her friends had left behind for her, she uses it to punch a hole through the realm, saving us and allowing us to return back to reality. Upon returning, Koichi treats everyone for their abyssal contamination, of course minus us because we're too cool for something like that, and Malvika tells us that we will all play an important part in saving Notlan in the time to come. She then reveals the plan. 500 years ago, during the Cataclysm, Notlan won, but was severely weakened, and when the ancient names were passed on to the people of the present, it would indicate that Notlan and their Wyabs would have gained enough strength to fight back against the Abyss once and for all. She then reveals that Kenich, Ionsen, and Shilonen were the heroes of the Scions of the Canopy, the Collective of Plenty, and the Children of Echoes, respectfully. And now the fourth, which was Mualani from the People of the Springs, has been awakened. This left the heroes from the Masters of the Nightwind and the Flowerfeather Clan absent. Malvika then explains that the heroes must come to the realization themselves, that pressuring someone into it could ruin the whole plan. Malvika explains exactly how she saved us, that all of the keepsakes she had been given were done so because the owners wanted to fight to save Notlan, even in death. And through, though all of the items were destroyed, the owners of those memories would have been happy knowing that they could save the group from the Night Kingdom. With Kachina returned, the group goes to the inn to celebrate. Of course, we as the Traveler, being just the good Samaritan we are, asks Mavwika in private to help defend Notlan from the coming invasion, which Mavwika agrees is a good idea, and she wants us to have an ancient name forged so that we can be protected by the Ode of Resurrection. Confident that Shilonen can find a way to forge an ancient name for someone who is not from Notlan, we are asked to go to her. Smash cut back to the Fatui, Capitano is informed that Mavwika has lost much of her power, but Capitano refuses to attack while his enemy is down, something about it being wrong, or some other moral such nonsense. We then get a voice that tells Capitano that Mavwika had chosen not to dispel the fog that covered their escape, and that she had allowed them to run off, and asks what he will do now. Capitano then acknowledges their usefulness and seemingly agrees to bring them in on the plan. Two days later, as we're hanging out around the Adventurers Guild because we have nothing better to do apparently, we find out that the Abyss forces are gathering, and the Archon has ordered the Scions of the Canopy to work with those in the Adventurers Guild in order to disseminate information and station fighters across Notlan in case of an Abyssal invasion. We then find out from Kachina, who was there to sign up to be one of the warriors stationed across Notlan, seriously, why are we still letting children do things like this? that Shilonen is ready for the commission to forge us an ancient name, and that we should go to the Children of the Echoes. Once we arrive, we go to Shilonen's workshop, and she's surprised to find out that we're an outlander, because apparently Mogwika didn't tell her that part, which makes the whole process more difficult since she needs to craft our deeds into the ancient name as well. Kachina then tells her about the Traveler's Journal, which, I'm gonna be real, I kind of forgot that we had. But Shilonen says that it doesn't matter, because we're an outlander, none of the deeds in the journal will be recorded in the Night Kingdom, making the forging of an ancient name nearly impossible. Despite this setback, Shilonen says that since her Archon had faith in her, she will simply have to find a way to accomplish the task, and to that end, we should speak with Silali. A letter is written asking Silali to meet with us, and it's given to Kanich, who Silali is familiar with. 
After some shenanigans, we actually end up meeting Sitlali at the Stadium of the Sacred Flame. Sitlali then tells Shilonen that in order to forge an ancient name for us, we will have to speak with the Lord of the Night, who is currently sleeping. And that while Shilonen goes to get the necessary items for the ritual, the Traveler can help her find Auroron. Sitlali believes that she's found his last known location and wants us to help her find him. We agree, and upon arriving, Sitlali says that she just struggles to believe that Auroron would willingly help the Fatui. And we also find out that Auroron was an orphan that was raised by the whole tribe. Silali shares her sense of sight with us so that we can track the phlogiston aphids that she believes will lead us to Auroron. This has the unintended side effect of allowing us to read her mind, which honestly is a hilarious part of the Archon quest. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Eventually, we take separate paths, and surprise, surprise, Auroron basically kidnaps us to the Night Kingdom, where he restrains our soul, and the captain appears to basically tell us to meet with him in person and tries to sow distrust in Mawika. Which, all I'm gonna say to this is, my guys, could you have found a more ominous and creepy way to go about doing all of this? That being said, not gonna lie, Auroron was kinda hot in the scene. Anyways, back on track, we're told not to tell Silali anything, which, I would have for sure done, but the Traveler does keep it a secret from both Paimon and Sitlali for the time being. Sitlali finds the Fatui camp she believes Auroron is being held in, and lo and behold, he is. Sitlali beats the ever-loving shit out of all the Fatui guards there to free Auroron, which again just further cements how amazing Sitlali is. Sitlali then asks Auroron why he was helping the captain, and he tells her that if he didn't, the captain would have gone after her, which seems to mollify Sitlali for now. We return to the speaker chamber where Silali pleads her case to the Archon, and the Traveler discloses what happened to Paimon after they lay down to rest. The next night we show up, and Auroron gives the all clear for the captain to show up. Now, basically this whole convo boils down to the fact that the captain doesn't believe that Mawika's plan will work, and that because of that he has a different proposal in mind. Given if Mawika's plan doesn't work, all of Notlon and potentially all of Tavat could fall into ruins. He thinks she's plagued with doubt and therefore won't do what needs to be done. But before he can go into any more detail about the plan, he runs off as he senses another presence rapidly approaching. This presence turns out to be Saint Lolly, who beats the ever-loving shit out of Auroron for lying to her and working with the Fatui. Auroron then tricks everyone with an illusion of himself before escaping as well. Saint Lolly is furious and explains that Auroron is probably doing all of this to make up for his duty to Notlon. Silali agrees to tell the Traveler more, but ends up getting absolutely shit-faced in the process. Silali reveals to the Traveler that everyone in her village fears her for her power, and that many dreams are crushed because of her talent and long-lived years. She then reveals that Auroron has an incomplete soul, and when he was a baby, her tribe tried to use him in a ritual that might have fixed the Night Kingdom, but would have cost Auroron his life. She feels guilt over the fact that she neither stopped nor advocated for this ritual, and she believes Auroron still has the belief that he should have died to save Notlon. Upon waking up in the morning, shit is fucked. The Abyss has attacked several outposts and places around Notlon. As all the other characters scramble to try and fight the Abyss, we go to meet Mawika to learn about this backup plan. Mawika then tells us that the backup plan is technically true, but if she were to use it, then it would erase everything from the Night Kingdom, destroying all of Notlon's memories and culture, and that the Abyss would still be able to evade again in some point in the future. Mawika states that she wants her people to win, but in a way that will cause the least amount of damage, and so her plan has the greatest possibility of allowing that to happen. She also reveals that she will be fighting for Notlon on the battlefields despite the fact that she no longer has her godlike power. We rush off to help the Children of the Echoes deal with their abyssal problem before deciding that Capitano's plan sucks the big one, and we gotta do something to stop him and Auroron from whatever it is they're doing. To this end, we need information. Chaska and Koichi decide to go super secret agent spy mode and go spy on the Fatui to get info on what they're doing. During this, they manage to figure out that the Fatui are looking for something called the Source Mechanism, and that now that they've found it, they will deliver it to Capitano. Upon returning and giving all this information to Mawika, she agrees that we need to come up with a plan to find and stop Capitano, but we need more information. This is where Sitlali arrives and tells the Traveler that Auroron returned defending the tribe against the Abyss, but stayed away from her. Because his soul needs to be occasionally restabilized, she gives him a gem that does that, but since he wouldn't accept it from her, she sent it with Aoife, one of Auroron's friends, and placed a spell on the bag that would allow them to view some of Auroron's memories. 
We find out that Aurora met Capitano when he was looking for Seat Lolly, and tracked him trying to figure out what his plan was, and that Aurora saw Capitano using spells from the Masters of the Nightwind, which surprised him. Aurora saves Capitano during his fight with Malvika to try and learn more about his plan to save Notlan, as Aurora had his own doubts about the Archon. Capitano reveals that he believes the only way to save Notlan will be to reconstruct its ley lines, and Aurora, feeling like he has a duty to Notlan, agrees to help Capitano. With the reveal of the full plan Capitano is putting into motion, we meet back with Malvika, who reveals that this plan would still essentially wipe all the memories from those in Notlan essentially saying that while everyone would have the same bodies, they would not be themselves because they would have no memories. Malvika then tells everyone she's located Capitano, and everyone agrees on a plan that would allow us to go fight Capitano and stop this ridiculous plan. We fight, but Capitano manages to activate the source mechanism for a moment and a piercing scream goes out. Aurora collapses in an apparent seizure before he starts attacking people. Capitano recognizing that Aurora is possessed by a spirit of a dead Conran soldier he fought alongside. He claims that Aurora's soul is fractured and about to break at any moment, and when that happens, he will possess the body to fight alongside the captain again. He also insults the captain's sense of righteousness, stating that it's the reason he will always lose his battles. In his mind, Aurora replays all the moments in his life where he asked those around him for meaning, only to get different and often not very helpful answers. The Conrian ghost tells Aurora that he's useless, he couldn't even do the one thing he was supposed to do, and that he should just allow himself to die. But Aurora refuses to back down, stating that he has not done anything meaningful with his life yet, and he refuses to die now. As he strengthens his resolve, Malvika uses her power to call to his consciousness, imploring him to continue to fight. As he comes back to himself, an ancient name appears before him, revealing that he has inherited the name Beatty, meaning devotion, and that he is the fifth hero, meaning that they only need to find the sixth hero for Malvika's plan. A voice then echoes around them, revealing that while Capitano's plan was not successful, it had awakened the Lord of the Night, who reveals herself to be an angel, or the true form of a Asili, that she has retained herself through sleep. She offers to reconstruct Notlan's ley lines as she has done before, at the cost of her own existence, as she loves those within Notlan. However, Mavwika declines, stating that the Abyss would invade again in the future and that she will stick to her plan. Capitano tells her, essentially, that she's being a hopeful moron, and that he is a survivor of Conria, and that if he had to go back in time to deny any false hope, he would have done so, and that she has no right to worry about the future if she cannot protect the present. Malvika tells Capitano that it's not for them to decide, as destroying Notlan's ley lines means destroying who they are. At this point, Aurora and Shilonen interject, stating that they would rather fight for their lives and take the chance they have now. The Lord of the Night tells everyone present that she will remain awake, so that if it comes to it, Malvika can give her the order. Given that only one more hero needs to awaken, and Capitano is outnumbered both by the power of friendship and general logic, he agrees to work with Mawika to protect Notlan, as it does have the potential to create the best outcome, saying that all of his Fatui subordinates will work to protect Notlan as well. Back at the speaker chambers, Mawika asks Capitano how he knows so much about everything going on, and Capitano reveals that when he and his platoon escaped from Conria, they worked to fight against the Abyss and Notlan, and eventually he became good friends with the Chief of the Masters of the Nightwind 500 years ago. Capitano swore that he would protect Notlan, and that he was returning to fulfill that promise. Mavika comments that she does not recognize him, and Capitano tells her that he has suffered from rot for the last 500 years, and that the face underneath his mask is so unrecognizable, unre he doubts anyone would recognize him. He then reveals that he knew our sibling, and knew of Dane, claiming that the reason Dane has not suffered the same degree of rot is because he has an immense amount of pain and hatred that far surpasses his own. He also claims that his strength is severely weakened, at which point Mavwika expresses her surprise. Capitano then laments that they could not have fought 500 years ago when they were both in their prime. He also acknowledges that he intended to use the Gnosis to save Notlan, and that if it were not destroyed in the attempt, he'd have given it to the Tsaritsa. Paimon asks what will happen when all six heroes are assembled, and Mawika explains that with all six heroes present, she will use a power that the first Archon, Shablanke, gained from Renova, who had power over death. 
She also states that the Abyss will likely increase their attacks, sensing the change in Auroran. Smash cutting to Shilonen and Sitlali as they visit the Lord of the Night, they ask for help in forging the Traveler's ancient name, and the Lord of the Night reveals that in doing so, Shilonen would have to sacrifice her life. Silali then reveals that she intends to use our status as a descender to somehow stall Mawika's death, as using the power of Renova will mean that Mawika has to die. Though the Lord of the Night basically says that the fate of someone's death and death itself are two different things, the Traveler can only affect if Mawika dies in the near future. The Lord of the Night then tells them that she cannot offer much advice, but that she's very proud and impressed by the determination of humanity. Silali claims that she's also looking into a way to save the Lord of the Night, but she tells her that it's going to be impossible, for all of her power is nearly spent. The Lord of the Night appreciates their efforts, giving them an artifact that will allow them to record the Traveler's deeds in Notlan, allowing for the forging of an ancient name. Silali and Shilonen return to the stadium where they give the Traveler the artifact and tells us to keep it on us at all times. And then just like that, the Abyss attacks everywhere. True war engulfs Notlan, and though yours truly and all the heroes of Notlan rush to aid in the fights around Notlan, it's a losing battle. Ever so slowly, more and more Notlanese die, and the Abyss claims more and more ground. Your choices from here on out affect how many people die and who you can save, but no matter what, choosing to save some will result in the deaths of others. The theme is clear. Not Lan, no matter what, will not come out of this war unscathed. As everyone rushes to save as many people as they can, everyone's energy is running low as the fights continue on for hours. Capitano and the Fatui fight just as fiercely alongside everyone else as abyssal creatures continue to pour out and overwhelm everyone. They set up a final line of defense, intending to defend the stadium and the civilians inside. Eventually, we are rushing back to the stadium when we stumble upon Chaska and Koichi. Despite our best efforts to purify Koichi, she's too badly hurt. She tells Chaska that she's sorry for always antagonizing her, that she never understood what she was going through, but that she loved her more than anything and all she ever wanted was for them to be a true family. She told her to never allow herself to be dragged down by her corruption and instead soar high and fierce and fight like only she can. No matter what, this is a death that cannot be prevented. You will always arrive just a little too late to save Koichi. Chaska screams, and in her grief, it seems like her abyssal contamination might take over. But at the very last second, she wrestles back control, and she awakens as the final hero needed for the plan to be put into action. As we arrive with Chaska to the stadium, the heroes gather and activate their powers as Mawika activates Renova's power. And here is where the Notlanese begin to take back their nation. Mabwika extends the power of the Ode of Resurrection to everyone in Notlan, something she can only do now, but claiming no other lives will be lost in this war. All of the heroes, empowered with their own power and Mabwika's, begin to systematically drive back the Abyss. With Mabwika providing aerial support by launching fireballs at the Abyssal Pylons, eventually the Abyss is all but driven out of Notlan. Mabwika channels all of her power, firing off an explosive punch, driving the abyss back into the very depths of the Night Kingdom, and also punching a hole into the sky, revealing that the sky is in fact fate, and the mess of red broken moons and planets that lay behind it. With the battle over, a celebratory feast is held in honor of all of those who fought and died in Notlan, and it's during this feat that Mawika asks us to journey with her into the Night Kingdom to defeat the abyss once and for all, as we are immune to abyssal corruption. She says that she'll go over the details tomorrow, as for now, everyone should enjoy the feast. Tilali pulls us aside later and tells us that she wants our help in saving Mawika as she is now fated to die, as she has used Renova's power. The next day, Mawika explains that she will only take us with her assuming that an ancient name is completed, as then we can be protected by the Ode of Resurrection. Otherwise, she will go alone. This also means that Paimon will have to stay behind. I know, we're just all terribly sad over that. While all this is happening, Capitano returns to the Lord of the Night and reveals that he knows Mawika must die for using Renova's power. At which point, the Lord of the Night recognizes that Capitano has been sent on a long journey by the Ruler of Death as well. Capitano has a final foe to face and asks for her help to protect all the lost souls and Notlan's future. And that's where the Archon quest leaves us. 
There's so much more I will be covering about this in the future, like all of the themes that we see present in Notlon, the terminology we've learned so far in the Notlon Archon quests, and of course I'll be covering my theories about the future of the Notlon Archon quests. So if all of that sounds interesting to you and you made it to the end of this super long recap, please like and subscribe and leave me a comment if you have the time. May the wind bless your travels.